Hey everyone, welcome to this video. Today we're going to be talking about the readability of your research because it's all about clarity. I'm going to give you seven tips that will help you to improve your readability. This applies especially maybe at a master's or a PhD level, so I really hope that they will be of value to you. Please also stay right to the end where I'm going to give you the most important lesson that I've given all my students with regards to readability. And it's the one lesson that will reduce a lot of frustration for your supervisors. I guarantee you that if you implement that lesson, at the very least, your supervisor will give you better comments. Please click the like and subscribe button so that I can keep making you such content that will help you in your studies, that will help you enter the workplace. Right, let's get into the seven tips. Tip number one, clarity is the most important thing. You always have to keep in mind the experience of the reader whilst they are going through your document. You have to try and make it as pleasant an experience as possible. Remember, your reviewers, your supervisor, they spend many hours on reading this document. So it's crucial that the experience is at the bare minimum readable. I always tell my students to keep reading their work so that they can constantly refine their arguments, constantly identify problems in the writing, constantly improve the readability. Keep refining your work so that you can improve the clarity of what you are trying to say and how you are trying to say it. If your reader has to start making assumptions about your work, then it probably means that you are not articulating yourself properly. You might then need to work on the clarity of how you are arguing something, because clearly, if assumptions are being made by the reader, you are not getting your point across properly. And you don't want that to happen. This is your research. This is your thesis. So you simply cannot afford to get a message out that is not what you intended it to be. Unfortunately, the onus ultimately lies on you, especially at PhD level. If you are not able to articulate your arguments in a way that shows that you can argue something that shows you can get a point across. The question arises whether or not you should be awarded the degree. So make sure you are clear. Make sure you articulate your arguments. Make sure you get the message across that you want to get across. The second important tip is to mix up and balance the lengths of the different sentences you use in a paragraph. You don't want to rely too much on long sentences or too much on short sentences. You want to have a nice balance between them. Remember, you've got to keep the reader interested. If you are constantly using short sentences, you are disrupting the flow for the reader. Conversely, if you are relying too much on long sentences, it gets frustrating and tiring for the reader. So you should definitely mix it up. Long sentences, short sentences. One or two short sentences, then a longer sentence. And of course, also work in complex sentences where you're grouping two ideas or two, two sentences together that pretty much explain one idea or one concept. The guiding point with regards to these sentences and their length is always to ensure that you have clarity. You don't want to frustrate the reader. You don't want to disrupt their flow. One thing that I always look at on MS Word, you can see what the word count is per sentence. And there is also a readability index. Make sure there's a balance between the length of your sentences and its readability. As a rough guide, I normally use an average of about 15 words for a short sentence and about 35 odd words for a longer sentence. Another tip is if I read a sentence out loud and I have to take a breath while reading, then it's probably too long. So make sure you balance the lengths of your sentences in a paragraph. The third crucial tip is the logic of the sections within the document. Every section and all its subsections must have a logical structure to it. What I always ask my students is, if they submit a chapter of their thesis, does it make sense that section 2.1 is under section 2? Does it make sense that section 2.2.3 is under section 2.2? And so on. If you get this bird's eye view of the structure and the logic behind the structure of each particular section, you can quickly identify parts of your work that might not fit in particular sections. And that's very important because as you keep writing, you're going to realize that some parts of the document don't necessarily fit in a particular section. That is unfortunately part of the research process. You are going to be cutting and pasting 
throughout right till the end on the day that you submit. So the sections reflect the logic that you as a researcher are trying to convey the message to the reader. And remember, your readers are critical. It's either your supervisor or the reviewers. Their job is to be critical. Their job is to shoot holes into your arguments. If the structure that you are using to argue something is illogical, how then can you expect to convince the reviewer? How then can you expect to convince the supervisor? A good approach to use is to use a top-down funnel approach and you explain the concepts broadly speaking and you keep refining and get more specialized or focused on what exactly you want to convey to the reader. In doing that, it's easier to set the logic of the different sections. Don't let your thesis become a puzzle to the reader. Your thesis is the completed puzzle. The chapters and specifically the sections and the subsections within the thesis are the pieces to the puzzle, but the puzzle has already been put together because you've submitted the thesis. And each chapter and each section and each subsection is merely shedding light on the puzzle and it's slowly but surely conveying more and giving more expression to what you are trying to convey. The fourth and sometimes very overlooked tip is neatness. This is the one part of the document that you can control. You can control the formatting. You can control the spacing of the paragraphs. You can control the spacing between the lines. You can control the spelling errors. You can control the numbering of the headings. You can control the numbering of the figures, the diagrams, the tables. So if you think about it, if you have a reviewer that is undecided and is on the fence whether or not you should pass, if your document is neat, they cannot deny the fact that you put the hard yards in to make it neat. That says something about your work ethic. It says something about the respect that you have towards your work. And of course, it says something about the respect you have towards the reviewer because you took the time to ensure that the document was neat. So following neatness, the next tip is punctuation and grammar. Once again, you can control this. In the current day and age with software that can check your grammar, check your punctuation, or even your syntax or sentence construction, there really is no excuse. Imagine a reviewer opening your document on page one and there's a grammatical error in the first sentence. What sort of impression do you think that will leave with a reviewer? Definitely not a good one. So as with neatness, make sure that you check the grammar. Send the document before you submit it to a language editor. Send it to a technical editor. But there's another important part of this. Don't rely on the technical or language editor at the end of the process maybe one month or two months before submission. I encourage you to adopt a mindset where you ensure that you do the technical stuff right from the beginning, because that also takes a lot of pressure off your supervisor. Having been a supervisor for almost two decades now, sometimes I get so lost in the technical stuff that I fail to actually critique the content. So if you're getting a review back from your supervisor, and most of the feedback is related to technical neatness, grammatical or punctuation errors. The time it's going to take to get this document finished and eventually submitted will increase. Your supervisor will be more frustrated. You will be more frustrated. So adopt a mindset right from the beginning that you ensure that whatever you write, you try as far as possible to ensure that it's technically correct. The next tip. Be consistent. Be consistent in your formatting. Be consistent in your style. Be consistent in, for example, the tables that you use or the figures that you use, the formats that they are, how you number them, the font that you use, the shading that you use. And again, start with this right at the beginning of your thesis, because as you write more and more and more and the document becomes more cumbersome, you might get to a situation, especially at a PhD level where you have maybe five, six, seven, eight hundred, maybe even a thousand pages. And if you haven't used a consistent approach with regards to pretty much everything, just imagine the stress that you will be in right at the end of the process, just before submission. So be consistent. Even if you are doing something 
incorrectly. Like for example, not citing a reference correctly. Be consistent while you are doing that. At the very least, you are creating an impression that you have respect for your work and that you are consistently applying a principle or a method or a technique. Now, of course, if you are doing something incorrectly, you would expect your supervisor to identify and correct this. But it's not uncommon to have mistakes creep through. You should also keep in mind that your reviewers might not be from the same country that you are from. Their first language might not be English or the language that you have written your thesis in. So their understanding of particular rules and principles in maybe writing technique or referencing styles might be different. Even if you do something wrong, as long as you're consistent, at the very least when you're fixing these corrections and you've maybe done it in a way called, let's call it A, and it should be in B, then you know that all your A's must become B. But what happens if you've done it in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, now you've got to go fix the document but the actual work to do it will be tenfold. The route to improving and correcting the wrong is therefore made much easier if you are consistent. The next step, use suitable linking devices between different paragraphs and even different sections. Start off sentences with words like therefore, as such, as a result, subsequently, consequently, but I also want to warn, don't use them too much. I have come across certain reviewers that don't like using linking devices. Once again, it's all about readability, but it's also all about flow. That's why I regard this as a very important consideration when you are trying to improve the readability of your document. Otherwise, what I feel happens is that sentences and paragraphs and sections might feel disjointed and the flow is disrupted. And sometimes it's important for you to remind the reader of what happened in the previous section or the previous paragraph. Of course, this is a subtle art and you mustn't force it down the throat of the reader. But just like any good movie, there are scenes where the viewer is taken back to a few scenes ago or to something that an actor said maybe 20 minutes ago in the movie. In the same way, it's your responsibility to keep the reader in the loop. Great, so those are the seven tips that I wanted to share with you to improve the readability. So what is that most important lesson that I want to share with you? I've read, reviewed and supervised many research projects. And the one thing that stands out the absolute most with regards to readability is the tone I get from the writing. More specifically, the author of the document must not come across as being opinionated. Rather, they must come across as being informed. It's a very subtle difference, but it's a very important difference. Quite frankly, as a researcher, you shouldn't have an opinion. This might sound controversial, but let me explain what I mean. Your research project is your opinion. The sections within your research project are the parts of the puzzle and the final completed puzzle is your opinion or your view. So what you are actually doing is, is you are creating a puzzle that you're going to be submitting to a reviewer and you've got to convince them that by using other people's work, that by using other thoughts, the existing literature, the current debates in your particular field, the methods that you've applied, maybe the unique methods that you've applied, the findings that you've got from these methods that are based on the literature and the literature that is based on the underlying topic. All of this adds and creates a findings or a result section, which ultimately is what you set out to achieve, which ultimately is what you are trying to convey, which ultimately is your view and your opinion. But here's the thing. This opinion or this view is informed because you adopted scientific methods. You adopted a scientific approach to achieve the results that you got whilst doing the research. What often happens is whilst reading, I find that the author is way too opinionated, not based on scholarly sound research. This is not the kind of message that you want to be getting through to your reviewer. A good way that I like explaining this to my students 
is by thinking of the literature review that they did. Let's take three sources that they used. The first source, let's call them ABC. The second source, let's call them DEF. The third source, let's call them GHI. So you have three sources, Mr. ABC, Mrs. DEF, and Mrs. GHI. Now, what does this mean? While you are writing your thesis, you are using these three sources to get your point across. You are using these three sources to articulate your arguments. But in actual fact, what you are doing is you are using them to get your view across, your informed view across. But the fact that you are using them means that it's an informed view. It's based on sound research where the established views of these three researchers are being used to articulate your informed view. So by using this example, once you have explained the thinking of the three respective authors, your view, your informed view becomes apparent. Where the three authors independently were firstly ABC, secondly DEF, and thirdly GHI, as you argue your point using these three references, you take a bit of each of them. So your informed view becomes a bit of ABC, a bit of DEF, and a bit of GHI. And this forms, for example, AEG, where you've taken a bit from each of these three authors and you've developed a unique, informed view based on the existing body of knowledge. So you've taken into account what the existing thought is. You've taken into account a wide variety of different thoughts, a wide variety of different debates and views, and you've developed your own unique informed view, which is AEG. If you take into account what has been written, you can only claim your place under the sun in this particular specialization. And out of that, you extract your view, more specifically, your informed view. So don't be opinionated, be informed. We've come to the end of another video. Thank you so much for being with me. I also have other videos that will help you with your research. Have a look at them. I have no doubt that they will help you. I will then see you next time.